Warmly welcome to tonight's conversation. It is part of a new collaboration in science programming between Kulturhuset Stadsteatern uh, and Stockholm University. My name is Johanna Kolgen and I have the pleasure to uh, sit here tonight uh, with Professor Frank Wilczek, the theoretical physicist, Nobel laureate, uh, connected in different professorial capacities to MIC, MIT, to Shanghai uh, Jiaotong University, Arizona State, and our Stockholm University. Thank you, Frank, for Thank taking you. the time to speak to us tonight. Thank Warm you. welcome. Thank you. So we're surrounded by signs that say Nobel calling. Would yeah. you like to take us back to that time? It's yeah, 15 years ago now Yes. when there was a call. Or was there a call? Is that how it works? There was a call. And uh, there's a story in my case. So uh, because of the difference in time zones, uh, the formal announcement comes at noontime in Stockholm time, which is six o'clock in the morning uh, on the East Coast, which is where I was. I had thought it was possible for several years that we would be getting the Nobel Prize. And so uh, every day, so I knew when it was going to be announced and uh, the night before I couldn't sleep. This was a regular thing for four or five years. I had a sleepless night. Uh, <laughs> And we had, at that time, we had a little clock with red digital uh, numerals that told what time it was. And uh, so I wasn't sleeping. And every once in a while, I would look at the clock. And it got to be 5 o'clock. And I said, well, look, you're not sleeping. You might as well take a shower, just in case, <laughs> so you would be ready. And so. I got up out of bed and, and went into the shower. And uh, I didn't realize two things. The first thing I didn't realize was that although the formal announcement comes at 12, the phone calls can be earlier. <laughs> and in fact, uh, at about 10 after 5, my wife came. Betsy, who's here, uh, came with our uh, mobile phone and came to the shower and said, uh, there's someone calling you <laughs> from Sweden and they, they have a, a very uh, charming accent and you, you should really should probably take this call. And I, I, I said, okay. And uh, so I stepped out of the shower. I have been taking the, I, I was soaking wet. And uh, I didn't uh, want to keep the uh, other side of the conversation waiting, so I just took the phone. And Betsy would draw, dried me off, as I was, <laughs> <laughs> more or less, <laughs> as I was uh, talking on the phone. And uh, they, they said, uh, congratulations, you've won the Nobel Prize. So that was the first thing I didn't know, was what they called early like that. And then the second thing I didn't know that I learned uh, the hard way that, that morning was that uh, I had envisaged that it would be a matter of they call and say, uh, congratulations, you've won the Nobel Prize, goodbye. But it wasn't that way at all. <laughs> they, uh, uh, the several Swedish friends wanted to congratulate and the secretary of the academy wanted to start explaining the procedures and what you should and shouldn't do and how to respond to the press. And this conversation went on for 20 minutes or so. And meanwhile, I was still soaking wet and shivering. <laughs> but I enjoyed it. It was like another state of consciousness. <laughs> and, and then uh, the first thing I did afterwards, after getting reasonably dry and putting on a robe, was call my parents, which was uh, the, uh, a very, very special moment because they, they had really lived a hard life, struggled through the depression, and invested a lot in my education and sort of seeing me through. Uh, and this for them was you know, a very, very special fulfillment. And However, uh, it involved calling my parents at about 5.30 in the morning so uh, 
what actually happened when I called my, was uh, my father uh, was really super grumpy, saying, well, do you know what time it is? What, uh, what, are you, what are you, I, I don't, whatever you're selling, I don't want to buy it. <laughs> and I said, dad, 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 it's me, calm down. <laughs> and explained to him what had happened. And of course, it was a very, very uh, emotional, f fulfilling moment for us. So that, that was the morning. Uh, uh, and then somehow a reporter for uh, Time magazine also had advanced information and knocked on our door. How did uh, they? Like, I don't know how, uh, or, or maybe they, maybe it was at exactly six o'clock. Anyway, they, they, they. Uh, maybe they staked, so they staked out your house and they, they saw that the lights were on. Yeah, something like that. I don't know. <laughs> it's a mystery. But in any case, they knocked at our door and right away started to start taking pictures. And, and uh, as soon as the announcement came, the phone, it was just, you know, we'd answer the phone and hang up, and it was still, that there's, you hang it up, it was ringing again. You can, so we just took it off the hook, and <laughs> that was an exciting morning. <laughs> you, you said that you had a feeling. How does that work? How is there a rumor mill? Is there does does the community, the wider physics community, know that these are the this is it's, it's about time? How does how yes. does that work? Well, in my case, I had been told by many people that they nominate they had nominated me for the Nobel mm -hmm. Prize. I don't know how true. <laughs> these th these uh, these things are, but then, uh, so I knew that that was possible. I, th you know, in all modesty, I thought the work was worthy, and uh, the other the the other factor that came in that made it kind of acute is that there's an order in these things. Uh, so our work relied on experimental work and theoretical work by other people. And in previous years, uh, th first the experimentalists and then the theorists who were kind of our uh, the people we built on, on most directly got the prize. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was, uh, it sort of like w was like a syllogism that, that we were gonna get you know, Socrates is a mitten mortal, and uh, well, whatever, and it, that we were going to get. <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> we were <laughs> logical, uh, logical consequence. We're going to talk a little right. bit later about patterns and symmetry, <laughs> but I'm starting to see that there's a pattern that yeah. emerges. We start to feel that it's your time. Uh, and physics is a small world, so yeah. theoretically, so people have a sense of what's, uh, what's you know coming and what's up there. I had to look it up on the internet. <laughs> it was awarded for the discovery of asymptotic freedom in the theory of strong interaction. Yes. So I had to learn a little bit about the basic theory of strong force. And <laughs> I felt when I read it that I kind of got it, but I couldn't tell you now. So would it be possible uh, to explain this to lay people? Yeah, absolutely. It's okay if it's not possible. Yeah, the, well, so there are four basic forces of nature according to our uh, fundamental understanding of physics today. Uh, there's gravity and electromagnetism, which have had beautiful, mature theories uh, in the case of gravity since the uh, 17th, early 17th century with Newton's uh, synthesis. And then Einstein's theory of gravity in, in, uh, in the first part of the 20th century. Then electromagnetism, which had beautiful equations and uh, re reached a, uh, a high level of understanding in the 19th century with Maxwell's equations, which we still use today. Uh, and then, in the t but in the 20th century, when people started examining uh, atoms and the interior of atoms, uh, they found that those two forces were not enough. They needed two other forces in order to account for what goes on deep inside atoms. Uh, one is called the strong force, which is the strongest force in nature, as its name uh, suggests. And uh, what it does is hold protons and neutrons together inside a nu in to make atomic nuclei. I mean, that that was the classic formulation of what the strong force is and kind of its most obvious manifestation in nature. Uh, 
because of our work and <laughs> the, the, th the way the theory developed, it turns out that uh, protons and neutrons are not the most basic objects. There are things called quarks and gluons that are uh, more f fundamental and, and, and uh, build up protons and neutrons and atomic nuclei and a lot of other particles too that uh, physicists discovered over the course of the, uh, the 20th century, especially uh, the later part of the 20th century when, when at, a, at uh, particle accelerators. And uh, then there's the weak force, which I won't talk about, it's weak. <laughs> uh, the the uh, uh, and so it was uh, a major item on the agenda of physics. I'd say, it was in terms of a person hours, PhD hours spent on it was probably the dominant activity of, of physics, starting from the 1930s to figure out what these forces are and, and what, uh, in particular, what the strong force was. And uh, a lot of experiments were done. There are big, thick books that, that summarize the, the measurements, and each, each measurement represents an enormous effort. And, uh, but the situation was very confused until some decisive experiments were done that, first of all, indicated that there were these more basic objects inside protons and neutrons called quarks. And then that quarks had simple properties when they got, when they when when they're studied at high energies or when they're close together, uh, and making those facts, cons uh, reconciling those simple facts about the strong interaction with uh, general principles of relativity and quantum mechanics was very was quite difficult. It was. Uh, uh, and it turned out that what we demonstrated is that if you took these very basic clues and demanded that you had a theoretical structure that was fully consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics and, uh, and this phenomena that the forces got weaker at short distances, you were led to a basically unique theory of how the force worked. That, mm. that, among other things, said that there should be gluons with very specific properties. Uh, and we got precise equations, which to this day are believed to be the, the uh, equations for the strong force. And uh, so th the work was getting to those equations and then also uh, pointing out consequences that could be tested experimentally because you know nu nuclei are very very small <laughs> <They're> not, <laughs> yeah. it's not easy to in investigate their properties so it was not a, a, not a trivial thing to to draw consequences of of these equations that people could actually measure and that that uh, that's that's what we did and since then as i said things get really simple at high energies uh, according to our theory, and uh, that proved out, but was also very useful because, I mean, useful to high energy physicists because at uh, machines now where the energies are much higher than, than we had in those days, uh, th this, this predicted behavior is much more evident and guides how you design experiments and how you interpret them. It also opened up the early universe where you had very, very high energies made that, instead of being very complicated to study, very simple to study how matter behaves in so those conditions. In, in case somebody uh, missed some details, we can at least summarize it by saying, and I, I feel this was very clear, <laughs> it, but I, I do feel that, that, that it's, it's obvious that this is a completely, it's a major step in a completely fundamental understanding of basically everything I think uh, so, yeah. in the world. And that has to... <laughs> so people for, for decades, uh, or centuries arguably, but very practically for decades were trying to, to solve this. Yes. And a lot of people had to be wrong. A lot of people had to be incrementally right. Yes. But you all, you guys, you and, and your colleague, well, cracked it in the yes. end. Do you remember, was that a specific moment? Is there like a, oh, moment? How does... How do you crack something enormous like this? 
Uh, well, there, were, there was a very central calculation which was whether the force between quarks gets stronger at short distances or weaker at short distances within different possible consistent theories, where we mean consistent with relativity and quant quantum mechanics, uh, which is very restrictive, it turns out. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's basically a unique theory where the, s the forces become weaker. Mm. And people had studied a lot of other theories and never found that behavior. Uh, when we realized that the calculation was indicating that the force was becoming weaker, that was certainly a very significant <laughs> uh, moment. That Did you have to leave your chair and run around the room a little bit? No, no. It was, uh, it was kind of an exhaust. The, the computations were very complex. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, I filled up notebooks with these computations. I checked them every which way because really the foundations for these calculations were not very secure at that time. There was, mm -hmm. so there was a, a bit of guesswork involved. So I needed consistency checks to calculate the same thing in different ways to see, to make sure I got the same answer. Uh, and, you know, at first I didn't. <laughs> the answers were all different. <laughs> so uh, the, the, um, the ma the real ma so the first magic moment was when everything started to be consistent, and then it was more a feeling of relief. I said, "Oh my gosh, finally, I got the damn answer!" <laughs> and then, uh, <laughs> and and I was happy to get an answer. And uh, okay, the fact that the forces were getting weaker, that was really interesting because that was something new. Uh, how much leverage it would have, I did not fully realize at first, but it, it was only a matter of a few weeks, really, from that initial uh, uh, calculation coming together and, and indicating this, uh, this, this behavior to having a candidate set of equations for the strong interaction, which people had dreamed about for uh, decades, but really very few people expected to see. Yeah. Uh, for instance, I mean, people had studied the forces between protons and neutrons, but instead of finding a simple result, things got more and more complicated the, 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 uh, the closer you studied. Uh, so the, f uh, the fact that you could find really simple behavior inside there was uh, a beautiful surprise. Because so this <laughs> was decades earlier, I mean, than the prize, of course. So yes. So the question is, what happens when, when you win the prize? Does it, because you already know what your achievement was, yes. and all of your peers know what your achievement yes. was. So what does, the, what does the, the Nobel Prize mean in this context? Well, <laughs> the... Uh, Is it like winning the Olympics? I, I mean, it's okay to say that it's just very cool. It's, <laughs> it's, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's the difference between uh, staring meaningfully into your lover's eyes and sort of getting together. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you know that the, that that something is happening, but but there's uh, there's another dimension when it actually happens, and that's <laughs> if, I, if I get and, a, a slightly and less fleshy analogy, <laughs> would be that it, it's uh, it's witnessed by the congregations. So it's it's yeah, it's a it's it's a it's and it's it's a personal satisfaction, but it's also a community satisfaction that that you know we recognize that this great problem has really been solved and sort of now it's official <laughs> and yeah. you know it's 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 uh and and I was I was really surprised because uh by the by the reaction of of my c colleagues uh some of whom I thought of as rivals and so but but uh but actually the, it was just an outpouring of love I think that 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 because it was 
you know, I've, uh, the work we did was highly leveraged. We built on a lot of other people's work. Mm -hmm. So it was really recognition of this whole community effort uh, that had succeeded. Uh, I, w I, w I would love to ask a little bit, because, because you said the beautiful equations before. Mm. It talked about it, and, and yeah. beautiful theories. Yes. So I need to ask about that, but I have to ask two more quick questions before we move on from that. One is, this all happened in the 70s, this breakthrough, so uh, you obviously you couldn't just go on Twitter and say, we have solved it. No. Uh, did well, you have to call everyone you know and say, I think we've got it? No, because I wasn't sure we got it, that we had it. No, I, w w the, the experimental data that we were relying on was pretty flimsy at first <laughs> and indirect. Uh, the full simplicity and convincing evidence for the theory only came when the uh, ex experiments were done at higher energy. So when the, the bigger accelerators that, that uh, revealed the simple behavior at high energy, so in undeniable form. Uh, I wasn't sure at all that uh, that that this was the final word. Mm. It was really only in the 1990s, I would say, when the uh, the large electron-positron collider LEP at CERN uh, began to uh, operate, that the evidence became clear and undeniable and. Uh, so, uh, I, 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 w <laughs> many of my colleagues were more convinced than I was about the theory. <laughs> I was willing to, to uh, entertain that it might be correct <laughs> and build on it, <laughs> but uh, I wasn't fully confident and I thought the, um, the phenomena might might have some alternative explanation, maybe. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm we starting were pushing to see where the too, satisfaction too comes hard from being <laughs> ultimately <laughs> resolved. Yes. Yeah. So you have to have a favorite for 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 the next winner. Would you care to wager who's winning tomorrow? Who's? <laughs> uh, well, Speculate. there are several candidates. I don't Do you have a favorite? My favorite. I don't know. That's, uh, you're maybe that's not allowed to say that's oh. dangerous <laughs> territory. But uh, okay, I, I would. I I th I think uh, it would be fun to uh, recognize the discovery of exoplanets. Okay. I think there's also profound uh, progress in uh, the use exp use of quantum mechanics to do computation and and treat information in new and powerful ways. But it's not clear to me that that's um, uh, mature. Yeah. <laughs> it's still very much up in the air, so it's not clear which contributions will be the most important in the long run. And the so <laughs> possibly, <laughs> probably exoplanets. I don't no, know. I don't know. I don't open. I <laughs> let me emphasize, I don't <laughs> have any inside information. Uh, no. Uh, I mean, it's <laughs> obviously also like I, I want it to be exoplanets because I, I, that one I understand. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's, a, it's uh, of course, it's not fundamental physics, but as an achievement in application of physics, you know, the, the optics and the information processing involved is just extraordinary. So it's an extraordinary technical, powerful application of, of, uh, of physics, and uh, I think. And it's uh, like a science fiction dream, science which fiction, is wonderful yeah. also. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you wrote a few years ago a wonderful book called A Beautiful Question, Finding Nature's Deep Design. And it has a central question, and the central question is this. Is the world an embodiment of beautiful ideas? Yes. And phrasing it this way suggests that the ideas would be there first and the embodiment comes later. And, and this is, of course, a, an unusual yeah position f to, to take for a, for a scientist today. And you take us in this book on a tour through the history of philosophy and science that explains why you would put it that way. Um, and even so, I think it's a little bit surprising in our culture, in this age, for a, a physicist to write a wonderful argument that involves art and metaphysics and human anatomy and many other things like this. <laughs> Could you explain how this book came to be? Well, when I was, a, it really grows out of my entire life <laughs> that uh, when I was a child, 
I was brought up uh, in the Roman Catholic faith and really took it very, very seriously. So uh, I, uh, well, I took it very, very seriously <laughs> and uh, really thought about that there's another world that's hidden, that's, uh, that, that describes what this world is really about that this is really it's not uh, that it has meaning that it has uh, a story to it uh, and I love that idea and I also love the idea that you know that that uh, uh, ideas have power uh, but you know when I, st I studied science well, I studied magic, first of all, but that was disappointing because it was all <laughs> trickery. Uh, the, the, but I studied science, and I uh, you know, found that there the really is a kind of magic. And, and when I was growing up, there was the time of Sputnik and people, you know, people the, rel the uh, uh, atomic bomb was a relatively fresh memory. The Cold War was on, so the... the uh, the power of scientists to do really surprising magical things was was very tangible. The space race was going, uh, and uh, so I got deeply involved in in studying that. And that those ideas were not uh, I wouldn't say they, they were not how should, they were, they're basically orthogonal to the <laughs> to the uh, to the religious texts. The traditional religious texts uh, on the face of it. So I I got very disillusioned and uh, with with and uh, for many years uh, kind of uh, just there was a, a void where where there used to be these cosmic feelings and things. But but as I learned more about science and and, uh, and really studied its history deeply and, and uh, for its human context, I was able to revisit those questions with a new perspective. And that, that's where the book came from, I think. I, I think, I mean... It's a, that's what I was, yeah. It's a very complex argument. But one of the things that you talk about in this book is that human bodies are, for instance, built, built to prefer visual input. So yes. that makes us hardwired to care very much about light and also perhaps patterns. Yes. You, for instance, also write about why harmony in music is pleasurable. Yes. And if I understand it correctly, and we don't exactly know, but probably it has oh. to do um, with that the brain successfully predicts symmetries uh, yes. in the early stages I, of perce perceiving sound, for instance. So again, like there's a, there are very obvious physical well, reasons for us to yes. enjoy harmony. Oh, I should have said, yeah, I, I mean, I left out the very important thing, yeah. which is that as I learned more about science, I learned that, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, uh, there's, there is a beauty to the world, and that's not an accident because beauty is a human concept and has very much to do with uh, things that you want to revisit, things that you find attractive and you keep coming back to, those, those are the beautiful things. And uh, on the other hand, we, we uh, are evolved to try to adapt to our environment successfully. Uh, and that means we are evolved to enjoy learning yes. how things actually work. So uh, when we learn how things actually work and succeed at it, that's something we find beautiful. And I find this so compelling. And it's very nice on the part of nature that it actually behaves that way. Well, yes, it's, it's incredibly <laughs> helpful that, right. that the things that we find beautiful and interesting, yes. when, we, when you start to look at scientifically, for instance, yeah. what is musical harmony, it turns out that these are mathematical patterns. Yes. <laughs> and that the world and the, 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 the things that we consider beautiful, including beautiful equations yeah. in, in understanding the world, yeah. it are in fact, they have predictive yes. capacity. I was astonished when, I think it was uh. when you were writing perhaps about the Maxwell ex equations or something like that, that you were talking about how, how now, the, the one thing that we learned in the history of science is that beautiful 
equations. Equations with beautiful symmetries tend to be correct. So now, these guys, yeah. the scientists, sometimes they just make, like, instead of figuring out something and then, try, then finding out afterwards, yeah, see, it was right, and the equation was beautiful. Now you just make beautiful equations, and then, yes. and then first you make them beautiful. That's very much how our theory of the strong... And then you realize that's how the world works. Yes, that's very much how our theory of the strong interaction works. We constructed a beautiful theory. It's very hard to make theories, as I said, that are con consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics. They have to have a lot of symmetry because it's almost impossible to put relativity and quantum mechanics together. But the fact that it's almost impossible, but is possible, <laughs> means that it's very constrained. <laughs> and the kind of equations that enable you to do it are very limited. And among those, uh, uh, the, the most symmetric equations turn out to have this behavior that we were looking for in, uh, in, in explaining how uh, quarks' forces get weaker at short distances. So uh, basically that means that the human <laughs> mind, which is of yeah. course the human body, because that's what it is, uh, is a kind of machine built to understand yes. mathematical relationships, yes. which means that the very thing that makes art powerful and uplifting and enjoyable is also the thing that makes us great scientists, or potentially, as a species, I think certainly so. great scientists. I think scientist. so. I think they have the same root, that we are, uh, we're, we're built to enjoy understanding and learning and being challenged. Uh, and if we don't destroy that, feeling <laughs> that uh, uh, nature doesn't compel us to uh, destroy it. And Einstein said the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. <laughs> well, that's yes. a gift, but that that's, that's, uh, didn't have to be that way. Well, but, it, but it turns out to be that way, and that means the world is beautiful because we can c come to comprehend it, and that's the kind of thing that we've that defines beauty, really. And, and what is lovely about this, well, many things are lovely yeah. about this, but one of the lovely things about this, obviously, is that it, it opens again for that idea of purpose or intent in the universe. It doesn't, the, the beauty of this system of which we are part doesn't actually require any kind of God. We have all kinds of very scientific no. explanations for how it no. worked out like this. But, but well, if, we, if, if we choose to, to tell ourselves that story, or for those of us who believe in that thing, it's it's also not in conflict fundamentally. With no, well, it has some system. aspects of uh, what people think of as uh, uh, fundamental religious uh, concepts. I mean, the concept that laws are eternal. Right. That, this, that there are underlying things that don't change. There's a kind of permanence just in, under, uh, uh, underneath the uh, uh, ephemeral behavior of, of, of many things, including ourselves. Uh, the, uh, the fact that the same laws work everywhere. The scale of things, the internal scale that, you know, Things we're we're very small compared to the universe, but we're very large compared to atoms, and we can have a, uh, a rich structure because of that. Uh, this it's just so marvelous. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I realize <laughs> and, that this is a dangerous uh, thread to follow in a way yeah. because it, it if we argue like if I'm 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 thinking aloud right now, and that's very dangerous. But I'm <laughs> I'm going to think aloud, and it's obviously that that if I if I personally, for instance, were to accept this this model as, as true, and then I would say, and I also accept all religions that are synchron synchronized with this or that match this as true. Yeah, it yes. means that then I have said that some religions are obviously completely wrong on account of, on this on my oh, scientific right. basis, and that usually doesn't make people who belo belong to those religions very happy. Yes, well. That's a little risky. <laughs> I, I need that. You said that you One thing that there's yeah. not, uh, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to say, there's there's no hint in scientific knowledge of a personal God, of a, you know, a, a person, something that has the characteristics of a person with a, with a person. The laws seem to be very abstract and mathematical, but they do have the the, the uh, char some of the characteristics of universality, of uh, timelessness, 
And of beauty that so, uh, that people associate with uh, central concepts of religion. So, I'm going so to you ask have you some of it, but not all of it, right? <laughs> so you, you mentioned <laughs> that you have a Roman Catholic background. Mm. Uh, now, I, and it struck me that I am vaguely aware that, for instance, many Jesuits do have advanced degrees in science. Yes, science. oh yes. So would you say that it's possible to be, for instance, fully a scientist and fully a Christian, even if that's not where you ended up? Yes, it is possible. There's a... Uh, Although it's a balancing act, <laughs> uh, and I think it's possible only if you uh, accept the concept of complementarity, which is another profound lesson that I take from uh, science. So complementarity is an idea that uh, was uh, formulated, popularized by, uh, by Niels Bohr, the great uh, quantum physicist, and it's the idea which is within quantum mechanics is a, is a theorem, it's not, it's not optional, it's a feature of quantum mechanics, that uh, there are different ways of describing the same object, both of which are valid and even complete in their own terms, but which are mutually incompatible. So in the case of quantum mechanics, you can describe where an electron is likely to be, or you can describe how fast it's likely to move, and you can make full descriptions of either of those, but you can't do both at the same time. That's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that's it. Uh, so there are different viewpoints. So generalizing that vastly, <laughs> uh, I think is a really liberating concept of, of complementarity that there may be different kinds of questions you can ask about the same thing, about the same phenomena that require different concepts to answer. Yeah. And those concepts may not be mutually compatible. I think so that's a really good answer. I think it's the right answer. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, uh, I mean, so <laughs> the uh, um, uh, so I mean, uh, a classic case is free will versus determinism. So, uh, although there are some arguments about this, I think it's to me it's clear that the uh, basic laws of physics are deterministic. If you know. If you had perfect knowledge of the state at one time, uh, you would be able to evolve it forwards and the equations have unique solutions. That, uh, so that it's deterministic in that sense. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we experience that we make choices. Yeah. And if we want to have systems of laws, if we want to... Uh, punish criminals, <laughs> if we want to understand other human beings, we need this concept that they actually make choices and have free will. So that's a valid concept to uh, address certain kinds of questions, how people will behave, how they should behave, or how they should be punished. Uh, but uh, if you ask about uh, the physical aspect of, a, of people, you know, how they're going to respond to medicine, how they're going to respond to uh, being shot. <laughs> uh, then uh, free will doesn't come into it so much, right? No. <laughs> right. And I mean, if we zoom out even more, and this is so, the point where I got very mind bo blown right. by the book. It was an observation, and of course now I forgot to note down who made the observation originally, but it's very beautiful you quote uh, this phrase that objective reality exists, it doesn't change. And now if yes, we add to that, see, do you remember who that is? That's Herman Weil. Yes. But it actually goes back to St. Augustine. I've been reading St. Augustine recently. <laughs> and uh, he had this concept that uh, from, from the God's eye point of view, uh, not, it, the world doesn't change. It's, it's all of it. Space, time is all laid out. That, that space and time shouldn't be thought of as separate entities, 
but as a complete of a, a complete entity of space time and the space time is just it's, it is. It, it is. <laughs> it and is. it's therefore sort of finished. <laughs> and it's only to us that crawling along our world lines, this is what Herman Weil said, that it appears to be uh, events unfolding in time. Yes, because time launches a dimension and that we're like moving along. Yes. But of course, from the pr perspective of physics, or St. Augustine's God, it turns out, <laughs> which I didn't know, uh, and it's slightly alarming, but very wise of him as usual. Um, from the point of view of physics, everything has already happened, and then we're back, um, and then this is the th point where my, my brain melts. I don't, I cannot, how do you even think in these concepts? Well, you well, have to, physicist, you have to use it? complementarity, you think, <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, to address different kinds of questions and uh, different kinds of issues, you have to use different concepts. Okay, <laughs> so I understand that we're not meant to understand the sort of fullness of space-time as as deterministic in, on the individual In everyday level. life, yes. Yeah. That would be a very dangerous attitude, right? Yes. I mean, you know, who cares? It's all... <laughs> but on some kind of, on, on, like, on a very large fluid. scale, everything is done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this is why sometimes ordinary folks find it surprising that scientists are also ordinary folks. Because it's how can you just continue living with this knowledge of how everything works. Isn't it also well, alarming and not just... I mean, first of all, there are plenty of holes in our knowledge. <laughs> we, we don't, we're, we're not done yet. And conceivably, we may have to rethink things we think we know. I mean, the, at a very basic level, that's happened in the past. But uh, let's suppose it does hold up, this view. Uh, well, I mean... In, uh, If I want to answer questions about cosmology, the the, uh, the large scale structure of things, uh, then it's very useful and, and, and really very natural to think about space and time as one entity, as space time. Uh, it's very unnatural to separate them, actually. Uh, and especially in, in Einstein's general theory of relativity, it's it would be impos almost impossible to separate space and time, and it would be much very ugly and unnatural. Uh, but okay, that's but but uh, for everyday life, we have uh, we don't get to see the whole thing. We get to experience a bit at a time unfolding, and uh, you can enjoy that too. Uh, you write, uh, I think in the context of discussing Newton, you write, is it not unnatural to separate our understanding of the world into parts that we do not seek to reconcile? It is that query to which this book, uh, your book, uh, for, for me responds. Um, and, and I think it's interesting, it, it, really, it just really struck me because I have been trained at university and by living in a secular society to think that that for that the sort of metaphysical or and certainly the sort of spiritual or religious uh, approaches to these mm. uh, things are they don't have much relevance however since i come from the humanities i am also trained by my education to feel that ar the arts have profound relevance uh. in answering <laughs> the big questions uh, of of, of uh. life and existence and helping us understand helping us grapple with these enormous concepts that we also uh, engage with as humans, especially with humans with this level of scientific knowledge that we have now as a species. So, so there is something interesting in how, uh, how arbitrarily these different fields um, are prioritized or respected. Uh, and, there is, and it feels like, it, it leads me to think two different thoughts. One is, I, I suspect that there's something about how we do science education that is perhaps completely as backwards because <laughs> I may not have ended up in the humanities if somebody had said to me, instead of saying, this is hard about physics or ah. this is exciting, they would have said, this is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then my other big question is, I wonder if we are at a sort of tipping point that your, uh, that your book is also one example of where we're saying, okay, the religious explanation models weren't great, but sometimes some, as some ways that we have been engaging with the scientific uh, r explanation points, they're perhaps too limited. So. So yes. what is the worldview in which we can, you know, confront these new challenges that we have set ourselves as a species? Uh, is there some new kind of way of thinking about science and all these things? And these are two different big questions. You can start with either you want <laughs> education or like... Well, I, I, I keep coming back to this concept of complementarity, mm -hmm. which is that 
there are different perspectives on the same phenomena, the same object, the, uh, the same universe uh, that have validity mm -hmm. and answer different kinds of questions or respond to different kinds of needs. And uh, you can use both. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 and uh, how should I say, knowing that uh, the laws of physics are what they are and the part of the basic constituents of matter are what they are doesn't get you very far in understanding human beings and everyday life. Um, so you need to uh, uh, you need to be open to both. Uh, now Okay, f for most purposes of everyday life, you don't really need to know about quarks and gluons and, uh, and the equations. On the other hand, it's mind expanding and it's beautiful mm. if, you, if you do. Right? Mm. So uh, just as you, know, you can get by without knowing anything about art or literature, or, uh, but... But it would be terrible. It's, it's impoverished, yeah. 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 Uh, that, so, so, so then, science, yeah. I think, has can be, of course, can be pursued as a uh, as a vocation that you know, absorbs the, the the important parts of a life, but it can also be, uh, you know, you you can enjoy art without being an artist. You can enjoy music without being a professional musician, and so forth. And you can you can and should enjoy science without necessarily being but a most professional people don't. science. Yeah. I mean that that's a bit of a problem. It's a massive problem, in fact, <laughs> right now because of the climate crisis that we're yes. in. Uh, most people don't engage with science even a little to the point where they don't even yes. understand why you have to listen when scientists say this is an emergency. Well, on the other hand, they. Uh, they enjoy their iPhones and, uh, <laughs> well, <that's laughs> and enjoy the productivity that science has made possible. So, so uh, maybe they should be reminded that uh, paying attention to reality is a good idea. <laughs> if, you were to, if you were allowed to dictate something about how science education would happen in the yeah. world, if, you, if we gave you a magic wand or some kind of science wand and said, let the, you, you are now the decider. Yeah. How, would you, how would you change science education? I would teach more of the history of science and how uh, the concepts we... Re instead of just saying, this is the way it works, say, well, it might have worked this other way and people thought that for a while, but then they had to, we had to, had to give that up to, because of this phenomena and that phenomena that, that I couldn't explain. I think it makes it a much richer uh, kind of experience, like a, sort of a dialogue between historical... And, uh, people love narratives and, and dialogues. And, uh, so I think there, sh there should be more of that. Uh, I also... I mean, I also love... That, uh, Adam... I, there's another, okay, so that, that's kind of conceptual, soft. There's another part of science, though, which is uh, quantitative and, form and logical. Uh, and, but that can also be fun. People really uh, enjoy doing logic puzzles and things like this, and I think that should be encouraged also. Like the kind of puzzles that you uh, buy in a supermarket. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So people do buy them, right? Because they, so they, they obviously they didn't have then. No one holds a gun to their head and say you have to solve logic puzzles. They go in and buy <laughs> buy the magazines and uh, the and uh, and I think that shouldn't for children. I think uh, that that's really should be encouraged. Solving solving puzzles. No. So active puzzle, active kind of reasoning, yeah. I, I, I actually fully agree with this, uh, that the history of science is, is a big part of, of, of the answer, but it, it also strikes me that, that the 
both thinking about the history of science and this development um, and, uh, and thinking about the Nobel Prize, which tends to be retroactive for obvious yes. uh, reasons, it, it does make us look a little bit backwards. So I thought maybe at the end we would look a little bit forwards before we open up for <laughs> questions. Uh, what is the exciting edge of physics right now? Like what is the things that, that you are thrilled to think about in your field right now? Uh, well, let me not give too parochial an answer because I'm, I'm thrilled about things that I've been involved in. You're alive. <laughs> Maybe the way. Everybody's very, here. here. Very, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there are some specific problems that are enormous and ripe, I think. Uh, physics has... has uh, achieved a remarkably detailed and complete and powerful theory of ordinary matter, the kind of matter we're built out of that, that people study in chemistry and engineering and so forth, the, the matter that's based on uh, protons and neutrons and electrons and photons. And, um, but somewhat embarrassingly, uh, astronomers in recent years have discovered that most of the mass in the universe is not any of that. <laughs> it's something else. <laughs> and we don't know what it is. So, how close are we to solving this problem? Well, you never know how close you are until you've actually solved it. Mm -hmm. But I have an idea about what it is called <laughs> axions that uh, they're, success they're predicted to be, they're, they're introduced to solve a fundamental aspect of uh, uh, physical law that, that appears to be very uh, coincidental in our current formulation of the law. So not we don't very like beautiful coincidences. Kind of right? No, we don't no, like Because we like symmetry. No, yeah. no. That's what, we like symmetry and we like things to make sense. No. <laughs> so, uh, so for instance, uh, you know, a glorious example of this is uh, in, uh, in Newton's theory of gravity you always had uh, the force proportional to the mass and uh, the uh, acceleration inversely proportional to the mass so that the acceleration was independent of the mass. So why should, the, why should it be independent? Why should everything move the same way in a gravitational field? And in Newton's theory, that was just a coincidence, those two masses could not have, didn't have to have a universal ratio, but that was what led Einstein, that coincidence was le what led Einstein to uh, formulate a new theory of gravity. Uh, and there were things like that in the weak interaction, there were a variety of, inter of, of, of uh, different reactions that seemed to have the same st intrinsic strength. Why should they have the same intrinsic strength? So you had to formulate there was a clue that you needed a theory that had extra symmetry. Mm. Uh, axions are a way of addressing a, another aspect of uh, physical law, which, is the, which appears otherwise to be coincidental, which is that the laws run forwards in time look very accurately the same as the laws run backwards in time. So although everyday life, if you, if in everyday life, if you took a movie and ran it backwards, you could tell that it was running backwards. If you look really small at what's happening uh, at, a, at the basic level, you find, you can't tell the difference if the movie's been run, running forwards or backwards. Hmm. The, the, the laws are the same. Uh, and that's a coincidence. With, with all the other things we've understood, that's still, that's still something that, uh, needs explanation. Wait, but is that, that weird? Because, like, isn't it, if time only has a direction for us, it, it, would that still be weird if we didn't have a direction in time? No, well, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe this is a super <laughs> difficult question, sorry. <laughs> no, the, no this, is, this is an aspect of, uh, of fundamental laws that not only appears gratuitous, but makes problems because now you have to understand how from laws that are reversible in time, you derive behavior that's not reversible in time. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole story about that which involves uh, uh, 
concepts of entropy and second law of thermodynamics, and also the fact that the universe began in a big bang as well, yeah, opposed no, it began. to you're right. <laughs> yeah. Yes, so, I forgot so, about that for a moment. So, so, so the 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 actual world, the solution of the equations that we find ourselves embedded in, certainly is not symmetric mm -hmm. between past and future, but the equations themselves are the law. Yeah, the no, that doesn't sound so right. That's a, so, so, no so, that's solving, yeah. so that's a really embarrassing coincidence, and axions explain it. So, so <laughs> and, uh, it, it's now, it's, it, axions would be like a mathematical solution? Can we experimentally, could we? They, no, they, they, they are actual particles with uh, very concrete properties, and they are predicted to be very difficult to observe. So and we haven't that observed them yet. That prediction is successful. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but also, if you run, their, run them through the Big Bang using our understanding of the laws and the properties that they need to have mm -hmm. if they're going to do their job, you find that they are a very plausible explanation of the astronomer's dark matter. They they just right, so now now the game is afoot, so to speak. The the, the challenge is, okay, they're difficult to observe, but maybe not impossible. And uh, I and many of my colleagues have been trying to design experiments, and persuade experimentalists to do these experiments that would would detect these. But do we think that it would be possible? Well, it would should be possible in like our currently existing detectors. No, we need new detectors. It's like bigger. Uh, bigger, but also more clever in some ways. It's like the the challenge that faced um, early pioneers of radio. How do you design antennas to pick up electromagnetic waves, and how do you just so this this is like that. You, so this is not electromagnetic waves anymore, but we're trying to detect a new kind of matter and you, have, you need suitable antennas that can pick up this dark matter that, uh, that interacts with the dark matter and turns it into a, a signal that we can uh, work with. I was speaking yeah. recently with a, a scientist yeah. from the team that uh, observed the Higgs boson and, yes. and he said that they're pretty excited about perhaps building a, a detector that's basically, I think it was like the circumference yeah. of Switzerland or something like that. But really what he was very disappointed in I guess mostly the material scientists and every, you know, people who build things. He was disappointed that we couldn't build one that's the size of the solar system because that would be best for, you know, to solve the problem. <laughs> um, but I mean, are we well, talking, you is, no, the that we need now is, would it be enough to have one that's just basically the, the sort of size of Switzerland or, or, or like the, or, I mean, is this a problem? It's difficult to tell. It's difficult to tell. I, uh, uh, there are ideas that I find very plausible that indicate there should be a whole new world of particles and symmetry called supersymmetry that would be revealed at somewhat higher energies than, uh, than are currently uh, accessible because it takes a lot of energy to produce heavy particles. And uh, most of, many of us were hopeful that the LHC would do that, but it hasn't. No. And then, you know, you have to persuade society and yourself that it's it's justified to spend another 10 billion euros or Especially something to build we're moving it, into to build, a sort of a time of emergency with, uh, with other with uh, you yeah. know many other competing projects or uh, yeah. okay so so that you uh, uh, you were asking but that about is the future clearly very exciting uh, get, yeah that's what that's exciting uh, but it it's uh, and it's exciting to me personally because i i've been involved in that story from the very beginning and continuing. But um, I would say a sort of broader frontier that's very exciting, that I'm really working on very actively now, is a new concept of information. Uh, this So information uh, in modern computers and standard computers is based on binary digits or bits that 
these are things that can take values zero and one, and you have a lot of them, and they process you process it to uh, to do all the things that computers do. Uh, now, but in quantum mechanics, the analog of this is a is a quantum state with two s states, a quantum object with two states. That's a very different beast. It turns out this is instead of and so we call it a qubit instead of a, a bit because it's a quantum bit. It's a little joke, a quant quantum bit. Uh, and the properties of quantum bits, when you put them, put a lot of them together, are quite different. It's a richer world with a lot more structure, and uh, there are possibilities for channeling that richer structure to do more powerful calculations. So because it can do like, computers. it can do one or zero, or is it both? Like in or between, yeah, it can do a lot yeah. of in between. <laughs> so uh, it's, a, it's a different beast. And uh, it's harder to deal with in many ways. It's more delicate, but potentially more powerful. So coming to terms with how you use that uh, poses many, many interesting challenges and questions and uh, that that's that's I think that's a growth area for the future so uh, yeah. quantum computing probably is, is the, what the buzzword that most people have heard but it's a much broader subject of coming to terms with the quantum world because now our technologies are becoming so powerful that we can really do that. So basically yeah. the technology is kind of catching up with the theory. Yes. And now both can be, need to be pushing ahead together. Like, yes, uh, yes. Which so. means that if somebody here is a student, this is a terribly exciting field yes. to get into. No, because the next couple of decades are going to be insane. Yes, yeah. I think that's right. I, <laughs> I think, it, I, I mean, I realize we have to open for questions, yes. uh, but I, I may, perhaps we can summarize what we've said so far by, by thinking or I, it made me think, I was thinking about Large Hadron Collider, which if you ever have the opportunity to go to CERN, the, their tours, you can go and see, you know, and the Atlas Detector is like a five-story building, and it's one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. And the, and the, it made me think it's, it's like a cathedral, but so, so is science. This idea that, that, that sci scientific knowledge is a, is a kind of cathedral mm. that, that is built by... by a, craftsmen who over time tend to become anonymous, you know, <laughs> over the centuries. We don't remember everybody's names anymore. Uh, but creating this beautiful um, monument mm -hmm. of understanding. Uh, and it somehow connects these things. And now these are the new spires <laughs> yes. that we're working on. Right. And the new spires are kind of phantasmagorical. They, yeah. they, they uh, it's Quantum mechanics is a beautiful thing. It's a little hard to convey without uh, a long story, but, yeah. but it's really mind expanding, and I highly recommend it. Yeah, mind expanding, <laughs> like <laughs> yes. So also, uh, it's it, as opposed to many other things that are mind expanding. It's completely <laughs> le legal, which is also wonderful, <laughs> much healthier. Um, I think we are ready for some audience questions. Don't be shy. There are no stupid. There's somebody who isn't shy at all. <laughs> who is going to have a microphone that comes right there? Uh, yeah. And let's try and keep the questions a little bit concise so that we can have more of them. Yes. Okay. Hello. My name is Gustav, and I'm a physicist, so I love understanding uh. things. But I have to admit that the statement that you had that a life without understanding or appreciating art was impoverished rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> and I have to ask you if you um, see it as a necessity to be able to appreciate beauty, to have understanding of art, uh, how the world works. No. Well, I mean, no. I mean, there are... I. I know physicists, for in, very good physicists, who, for instance, hate music. If there's, they run the other way. If there's, you know, uh, or, uh, and many scientists aren't interested in art. Uh, in my experience, the the best scientists tend to. Do have <laughs> do have an appreciation of many different things. The most creative, I shouldn't say this. I mean, you, uh, but but it's 
it's not necessary. No, it's not. You can. I guess maybe what I should say. Okay, the, uh, an appropriate thing to say is that. Certainly in modern theoretical physics, it's kind of, it's very uh, uh, separated from everyday life. And when you're trying to make progress, if you're trying to find new equations or design new uh, objects, or materials, uh, we don't have much to go on except a kind of aesthetic feeling. Okay, we're not, we're not making analogies from everyday life so much. We're trying to think, how could things be more beautiful? <laughs> how could things, well, and when, when you have a good idea, you sort of recognize that it's, that it's on the right track because things make sense and, and, and click together and are more beautiful. So there's, it doesn't have to be art in the sense of painting or, or sculpture or, you know, Campbell soup cans or whatever, but, uh, but this kind of, I think this kind of aesthetic feeling within science is really essential to uh, doing, doing but the very you best also, work. Yeah, you also say in the book that, that or you remind us in, in the book that of the sort of kind of obvious, it should be obvious, that, that of course it's also um, many of these, of, of the arts are languages or skill sets in a way. Yes. That that's the, the brain can, you know, like simple harmonies before it likes complex harmonies. Yes. So if you're confronted with art that you're not enjoying at all, it might be because you, there are some previous stages that you haven't had access to. Oh, very to. much so. It yes. doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have, um, that your brain wouldn't enjoy that sort of thing at right. all. Uh, but then, would you yes. would you would you st would you go so far as to argue that that exposing yourself to the arts in different ways is a good kind of training for, at least in having some kind of plasticity in your approach to scientific projects, problems? Well, I don't think it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> Whether it's the most efficient way, I don't know. But it's it's an enriching aspect of human life, and I think it can help. And I think, I'd, but I not, but it's more. I don't. I don't. I'm not sure it's cause and effect. But I think the desire to kind of expand your mind and look at things in different ways that leads you to science and creative work in science also leads you to be interested in other things. Well, <laughs> well I mean, as a humanist, I would say that it's also about being interested in the impossible. Yes. Being interested <laughs> in the things that are not yet there, yes. you know, that that's what the, that's what the arts are about for me, and I, I suppose that's also what the science would be about. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this question. <laughs> Do we have another one? Uh, yes. Hello. Um, another question on uh, aesthetics and elementary particles. Uh huh. Um, but first off, uh, how many pens do you have in a, your breast pocket? How many pens, pens do you have in your breast yeah. pocket? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I an don't know exactly. Oh. I probably <laughs> about ten. I'm sure, sure there's a good reason for that. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, there's a very good reason. <laughs> you don't want to be without. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Of course. Like uh, being a, a layman myself, uh, what I know about quarks is that they have a number of different properties and mm. they are small. Yes. Um, but it's very hard for me to get my head around the concept. Um, and you've been uh, mentioning here today that uh, uh, we as human are uh, uh, visual beings. We like to see things in patterns. So I was wondering, um, do you have when you study quarks uh, with your profound knowledge of the concept, do you have a mental image? of quarks? Do you see them in your studies? Well, I use many different kinds of images in different contexts. Uh, but the properties of quarks are so different from the kinds of things we deal with in everyday life that the mental images have are dangerous. They have limited validity. On the one hand, but okay, but but I should make a general comment, uh, which is that human beings are highly visual information processors. That's what we're really good at, <laughs> is and it's an amazing thing. We can take images that arise th 
through these tiny holes <laughs> and are projected on the retina in two-dimensional uh, patterns and construct a world of objects in three dimensions that we can move around in with colors and we know something about the chemistry and objects. And, it's, and we do that really fast and effortlessly. Uh, computers are better than humans at many, many things like chess and Go and uh, arithmetic. Uh, but, but humans are much, much better at visual processing and um, a lot of our brain is devoted to that. So if we can bring in those modules, <laughs> that visual processing, it's very, very powerful. So it's all, I always try to make visual models. In the case of quarks, it's not, I don't visualize them, well, in any one way, but different, different, different ways in different contexts, but uh, Really, in that case, more what I visualize is the equations and how the equations might uh, uh, be rearranged or not the quarks as objects, but the underlying fields and the fluctuations in those fields. So the deep, the construction of visual models is uh, a creative process that uh, has to be conditioned by the strange properties of the things you're trying to deal with, and so. Hang on, there was a movie, wasn't there, called A Beautiful Mind? I think there was, and you, he literally he was playing pool, and you could see the equations in there. Do you sometimes see equations in there? That's a physicist thing. I can't say that I literally hallucinate equations, <laughs> <laughs> but. but uh, Visualize, not hallucinate. I, well, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I do visualize, but but. Uh, I still find it helpful to actually write them down uh -huh. sometimes on a, uh -huh. but uh, but not necess but you know have what I f frequently find this is really you know, every day kind of experience is okay I I uh, work with equations during the day and write them down uh, but then my uh, so then I put them away and my mind keeps working mm. and it's not. And it's working, I think, using the same kind of hardware that's used for visual visual processing. So the, the, the things get rearranged, reprocessed, re mm -hmm. and uh, so I don't literally see anything, but, but I have you a don't feeling. Need to because I the brain is doing the thing. I have a feeling yeah. that that's that that's uh, 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 that's what's going on. It's just like you know Beethoven was deaf yeah. when he was composing in his later career. So he didn't literally hear the music. Yeah. But he did. You yeah, know, of in course. a real sense, he, he was able to deal with the information as if it were sound because he had a different representation that was so powerful that, that uh, it didn't need to be air vibrating. <laughs> I, really, I remember also now there's right. a scene in, in um, um, the West Wing where Toby Ziegler, who's the speech writer, is yeah. writing, he's playing pool as well, in fact, and then somebody says, aren't you supposed to be writing a speech? And he says, paper is for wussies, and then he says the sentence that he's thinking. <laughs> it's exactly this. Maybe this is a, a universal phenomenon. Uh, yes, we had a question in the back. Did that just yes. Well, good evening, and thank you so much for this interesting talk, both uh. of you. Um, I've been thinking about what you've been saying about beauty and about uh, it being symmetrical mm. and how it being symmetrical means it makes sense and therefore it's beautiful. So sort of the definition of beauty is, is sort of contingent or dependent on this symmetry. And uh. me coming from the arts, um, I'm wondering if we look at the theories of beauty that exist within, for example, painting, mm -hmm. dating back to the Renaissance time, we have something called the golden ratio, mm -hmm. where we have the 70, 30%, um, which is perceived as beautiful. Uh, and it means that, for example, for those that don't know the golden ratio, that if you were to paint a landscape, you would have 30% sky and 70% earth. And uh, that would be, you know, the, the perfect. That works. Yes, that would be beautiful in that sense. But it's not symmetrical. Uh, 
no. you think about it. So I'm wondering yeah. if the theory of what's beautiful within science and the theory of what's beautiful within art are in some way conflicting. Mm. No, I wouldn't say they're conflicting, uh, on the contrary, but I think they have uh, commonalities, but I don't think the only form of beauty is symmetry, mm. nor is every aspect of uh, science and physical law beautiful. I mean, uh, so symmetry is, is certainly part of uh, science and it's especially central in our deepest understanding of the fundamental laws. Uh, and it's certainly also an important aspect of art and the whole concept of perspective, for instance, is based on symmetric and geometric constructions and uh, people find uh, it, it in when they, uh, for instance, uh, a very convincing example I think is in decorative art. If you look at catalogs of what people have used in, in across many civilizations to decorate walls or vases or so, they, they use symmetrical patterns enormously much and especially, actually, when they're trying to uh, depict the sacred inside mosques or inside cathedrals, you find symmetric arrangements of things. But it doesn't exhaust art. There's many other things that people find beautiful uh, for other reasons uh, than understanding how the world works at a physical level. I mean, of course, people also relate to other people and so a lot of art has to do with the human form, which is not particularly symmetric, uh, or landscapes, which are not particularly symmetric. So symmetry doesn't exhaust art by any means, nor does it exhaust science, but, but it is a common theme that is really deep in both and, and, is, a, and, and is common. They, they, they know, yeah. For profound reasons that we've yeah. discussed, and I mean, I think also when you, the golden ratio could also be expressed as a, as a sort of recurring. I mean, sometimes you see it drawn as a sort of spiral, as a shell shape. Or yes, that it's, that it's also like recurring proportions. Yeah, the, go the golden ratio occurs in many, many different contexts. Yeah, but, and and that would but, that would make it related in the same way as harmony can also harmonies can be expressed. I learned <laughs> yesterday from Frank's book uh, that if you look at it mathematically, the musical harmony, of course, is also about like recurring proportions and uh, between between these frequencies, which is obvious when you think about it, but I've never thought well, about that it. Was it was kind completely of the, mind blown. That was, in a way, I would say, the very first scientific discovery. This was uh, by Pythagoras, that the notes that sound well together are uh, thing, uh, the notes associated with strings plucking strings whose uh, lengths have simple ratios. So uh, th this, these kinds of regular uh, correspondences between uh, the physical world and our perception of beauty go way back. They're still not very well understood. That one in particular is still kind of mysterious why we find it pleasing to have notes that uh, whose frequencies are uh, in simple whole number ratios that's that's uh, I don't think well understood at a physiological level but uh, it's, it it's a fact about the world and, and as I said it was probably among the very first non-trivial laws uh, that people discovered. So it wasn't it was not a law that related to s motion or time, but really to the relationship between uh, perception of beauty and physical lengths. Yeah, <laughs> and, I mean, and it's also fun because it's, we think of his Pythagoras as a mathematician first and foremost, right? But he, here we are again with the sci scientists doing you know, if he was doing, but let's assume that he was doing doing these kinds of 
practical things and theoretical things, oh, and, and also was... placing it at, at the very edge where it becomes where it's still incomprehensible and sort of gets the, to that metaphysical level. Yeah, and he was also a cult leader. He was very much a <laughs> yeah. like an actual uh, cult, religious cult, cult leader. Cult, yeah. yeah, but it was a unique cult. It was a cult of numbers. They. Uh, Thing. Maybe that's the answer. <laughs> I said, shouldn't we need some kind of new worldview? Maybe that's what we need. There was the Pythagorean Brotherhood, and uh, they also had lots of women, actually, mm -hmm. for that time, very unusual, that uh, believed that all things are numbers. That was kind of the, the, the leading principle of this cult, and they tried to explain the structure of the universe based on uh, numerical proportions. So, in some ways, it has the same spirit as modern physics, although the <laughs> mathematics was relatively primitive. But uh, and I think like, right. mo like modern <laughs> physics, with a lot more wine, <laughs> yeah. a little bit less like ba scientific basis. <laughs> All right, let's do one more. Perhaps two. If we're like, there's somewhere there's microphone. Hi, yes, I'm here. Um, yes. Firstly, thank you so much for an incredibly interesting talk. It has really brightened up an otherwise dull Monday. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd like to ask, I feel that many fields in this day and age are undergoing a change and growing more diverse, but the scientific community is not really giving off that impression. So I'm asking you, who is on the inside, um, do you have another view on that? Do you feel that it is more diverse than we give it credit for? When it comes to things like gender and ethnicity, I think. Uh, instance, yeah. Or, yeah. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. No, it's not more diverse than you give it credit for. That's great news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're working on it. I mean, I think there's a there's a there's an active will to try uh -huh. to rectify that situation. I think I would be happier, and I think most of my colleagues would be happier to have a uh, more representative balance of and. Uh, you know, I would just like to tell women not to be afraid, and uh, that, that there's a one, you know, there are wonderful things that you can enjoy and contribute to. Yeah. And do you so, think that it's that the work uh, environments are changing? The work environments are definitely changing. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, Yeah. So, so no. Please, but please join in. <laughs> join the party. We want you. Yeah. yeah, and and, and I, I would hope for the, the, some of the ideas we talked about that uh, that science is not separate or mm. shouldn't be separate from art and music or other human endeavors, and that uh, it should also be regarded as or. Should be reg should be regarded as, or can be profitably thought of as, among other things, a historical process, mm -hmm. a kind of dialogue and narrative. I think these things make it could make it more universally appealing. Yeah. Yeah. I think we have time for one more. Yes. Hello, and uh, <laughs> thank you for the the discussion, Mr. Wolchek. Um, I would like to ask about the problem of consciousness, mm -hmm. human or not, and uh, widely in scientific fields and, and otherwise, it's, it's often treated as a uh, problem of second priority, uh, even though science, in, in my opinion, is essentially a part of consciousness as we're thinking <laughs> about it, right? Um, yes. Why do you think it's justified uh, that we do not have it as the largest priority? Why do you think that's justified? And, and why do you think we do that? Okay, so let me so let me uh, first I'll take I'll I'll answer this in the style of complementarity. Okay, <laughs> okay, so so the first thing I would claim is that uh, there's no evidence at all that. Uh, there's such a thing as mind distinct from matter. Dis, dis, uh, so when physicists or scientists in general do experiments in modern technology, very delicate experiments, measurements of great sensitivity, uh, they have to 
make all kinds of uh, corrections. They have to make sure that the temperature is under control and the pressure is under control, that you shield from electromagnetic signals, that things don't shake, all kinds of things. But one thing that they've never had to take into account is what people were thinking. Mm. So there's, I think, overwhelming evidence or a overwhelming uh, circumstantial evidence that uh, matter sort of uh, can be understood in its own terms without referring to uh, a conscious thought waves or conscious interventions of things that are affecting matter. Uh, there's also, I think, based on uh, modern experience with uh, computing machines, that uh, more and more do things that we once, that people once thought would require mind as a separate entity. Uh, that uh, with computers, we definitely know how they're made, and they're made of physical, um, designed on physical principles and operate by known physical laws, and yet they'll beat you at chess, they'll beat you at go, and uh, so they, 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 uh, they do things that were once thought to be the province of, of mind and uh, unique in, uh, uniquely of mind and intelligence. So I think there's this, based on things like that, uh, there's a very strong case that mind emerges from matter. Mm -hmm. So that's one side of the complementarity. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, consciousness is uh, something, I mean, my, the way we experience the world and the way we uh, construct our models of the world is based on mind, <laughs> it's based on conscious perception, and, uh, uh, and that, although it may emerge from matter, uh, looks back on matter and makes sense of it. So these are complementary aspects. You can't, you can't, uh, you can't, I think there's every reason to think that mind emerges from matter and doesn't need a separate uh, uh, explanation. But on the other hand, it's mind that experiences matter and without mind, uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> no, one, no one would care. <laughs> and so uh, the question, questions wouldn't arise. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but th th <laughs> they're complementary. So, uh, well, I guess what I what I really want to emphasize is that the statement that mind emerges from matter in no way diminishes what mind is. It enhances it because it means you can relate it to. other phenomena and experiences, and you can en enhance your understanding of it. So it doesn't, the idea that mind should be free of matter could have been true, doesn't seem to be true, but uh, in retrospect, knowing that it may not be true is a real challenge. Okay, so, so, okay, so now, now, uh, Mr. Physicist, Mr. Neurobiologist, or Miss, <laughs> Mrs. Uh, how do you, okay, now you have the challenge. Okay, so matter doesn't seem, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not obvious how consciousness as experience emerges from our equations that describe matter. I don't think there are any showstoppers, and people are gradually understanding more and more about neurobiology, and so far, they haven't had to introduce new physical entities or new physical laws. It's just, you know, it's just molecules all the way down. But, uh, but we learn that matter has potentials and abilities that weren't obvious at all. 
and so that very much, I mean, is that fact that, that matter can think and uh, talk and perform on stage, that, uh, that's a very remarkable thing that's a challenge to explain. Mm. How do you get from the laws to these you know, abstract, strange laws of quantum mechanics to that? Well, it feels like that, that summarizes that to me is, you, you everything we've talked about tonight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, that's what I, I should. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I should have said in answer to your question about the future <laughs> of physics. So, so there are concrete problems. I should have said this. Yeah. So there are concrete problems like the dark matter and axions. Mm. There is this frontier of quantum information. And to me, the kind of the third great problem for the future is understanding how mind emerges from matter. That's wonderful. Yeah. So here we have, uh, you know, <laughs> laws of nature create these meat states in our mind that can, yes. that can reflect on the laws of the cosmos. It's fantastic. Yeah, yes. We have, we're going to have to end yes. here. I don't see any nobler point that we could end <laughs> on, in fact. Dear friends, Frank Wilczek. All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you.